You're in the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, this episode of the Paracast has become more difficult than I ever, ever expected to produce. And the main reason is Skype. It's Microsoft's fault. I tried to call our guest because he's using a cell phone. Very good cell phone connection. And that's Richard Bonenfant, as a matter of fact. And what was happening here is I couldn't get it to make an outgoing call. Try as I might, I couldn't get it to make an outgoing call. So I did a solution that some people are doing now with Skype, which is to download and install the older version. I'm using Skype 8 for the Mac. And Microsoft has agreed that the previous version, Skype 7 for the Mac, may work better for many people. And guess what it does? But we're so happy to be here after all this aggravation. Richard, it's nothing you did. Okay, I'm I'm glad about that. I mean, I get blamed for everything, so I don't want anybody else to share the blame. So basically, everything is working fine. It looks like the show is working fine. Richard, please meet our weekly co-host, Jay Randall Murphy. Hi, Richard. Welcome to the show. Hello, Randall. This is Rick. Yeah, I'm pleased to be here. Thank you very much. Now, I'm looking over your credentials here. You sent me a bio. And you studied first as a doctor, a medical doctor? When I first uh, started working professionally, I had only a master's degree in anthropology. It was only later that I got a PhD degree in uh, cognitive psychology. What led you? By the traditional scientific path into things like animal mutilations and near-death experiences. Well, I actually got my Ph.D. doing a study on near-death experiences. Uh, I was uh, in Albany, New York at the time. I was working for the health department. And uh, I, after having a master's degree for a long time, I decided to go on to my Ph.D. degree. and. I did it through the State University of New York and uh, another university in conjunction with another university. And I did a study of people in the Albany area uh, at St. Peter's Hospital, actually, who who had uh, recovered from uh, near-death experiences in the cardiology unit and um, on the Long Island uh, um, Brain Trauma Center. And I interviewed these people in, in order to determine how long the uh, after effects of your death experiences lasted. And that's how I got launched into that career. Now, what brought me into near, <laughs> into animal mutilations was pure curiosity. Uh, I, have a, I do have a pretty solid medical background. So when I first started to read about these events, and it, I was so curious that the, the ways that these cattle were being mutilated, and not only cattle, but other animals, it was so bizarre that the, the way they were being mutilated that I pulled all the symptoms together and then began a search of the medical literature uh, in order to find something that linked all of these different mutilations together. For example, uh, the, uh, the tongue is often missing on uh, a cow that's been mutilated. and Sometimes the eye is taken, and uh, the external ear, which is basically just the cartilage, uh, is taken. Uh, so, and, and the most most bizarre of all was ex- exsanguination, which is a removal of all the blood from the animal. That's very, very rare. You hardly ever find cases like that. You know, when I listen to you talk, Rick. I think I'm listening to CSI. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. Uh, is there, um, you, would you like to intervene at this point, or uh, is it just your, your comment? No, it's what I'm saying here is that you're making a description of how these are found. It sounds almost like a ritual to me. Uh, well, they they pretty much ruled that out. I mean, the, uh, the way the animals are, are 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 found and and um, I, I'm talking about uh, physically is so bizarre that we don't really have any way of uh, inflicting those kinds of mutilations 
uh, even with uh, our technology, especially in the field, if you could take a cow and put it in a veterinarian's office, then you could not reproduce some of those wounds that they, they experience. Uh, it's very, very difficult to take blood out of an animal without leaving any blood in the heart, or it's very difficult to do those um, those cuts that they do. It, you know, you think of a straight razor as being the, the most you know, sharpest instrument we might have, or a scalpel, but these things are, um, uh, I'd say, a couple degrees sharper than that, so that, that's also bizarre. And they also have these cookie-cutter-like portals through the skin which would appear to be made like a laser. And uh, what's bizarre about that is those little portals that they take, which, which are ranged, you know, from, from an inch or so to uh, maybe four or five inches, uh, they, through those portals, they extract the internal organs. And, um, you know, like, like the intestines and the, the colon and the heart and the liver and uh, that, that's extremely bizarre. I mean, to do that, you would have to not only make the cut, you would have to reach the organ and you would have to, for example, remove all the collective tissue around the organ, all the collagen and other connective tissue. That means destroy the structure and liquefy it. And then you would have to have a suction device to take it out of the animal uh, through a, a tube of some sort. I mean, you just don't make a small opening like that and take out a heart. It's very, very bizarre. So all these symptoms were, were just excited my curiosity. So uh, I didn't go out in the field. I would, it wasn't that um, uh, fortunate to have something like that happen around uh, Albany where I was working at the time. So I just did a search of the literature and spent months and months trying to find something that linked all of these particular mutilations together. And I found, I think I found it, uh, it was prion diseases. And prion diseases is another strange type of uh, disease, which is it's infectious, but it, it's not related to the RNA or the DNA, which are normal channels for infection. This is a protein. Uh, it's a, a prion is a protein. And we don't really know, okay, we're going to be talking about the prion. Uh, the, this is a protein in the brain that we don't really know much about, but it is not a, a traditional um, genetic material. It doesn't contain RNA or DNA. It is just a protein, which is a string of molecules, but we don't know its function. However, when this is mutated, it causes diseases, particularly in the human population, it causes Alzheimer's disease. And in the animal population, it, it causes similar problems, but we can give it different names. In the animal population, the most popular name is mad cow disease, but it's not limited to cows. It's actually spread to a lot of different animals that were not previously infected. However, now we have a case where the prions have not only jumped the animal-human species barrier, but it also has crossed other animal barriers from uh, sheep and cows to mink and elk and deer and uh, many other species as well. And the whole idea behind the animal mutilations may be to monitor the spread of those diseases. We're not going to look for mad cow yet. In fact, that's what William okay. Shatner says he suffered from in the TV show Boston Legal, if anyone remembers it. He'd look at somebody and say, Benny Lane. Anyway, with, <laughs> with Rick and with Randall, you're in the Paracast. We also have swag. You know, we have all these exclusive Paracast things that you can buy. We've got like, I guess, 60 or so different items and entails T-shirts, sleeves for notebook computers, iPad cases, mouse pads, the Paracast Jumbo tote bag, 
all sorts of t-shirts and jackets and stuff like that for men and women. We have a Paracast aluminum water bottle. All this stuff, you go to store.theparacast.com, store.theparacast.com. What makes it special is that the items are the best quality, you know, great t-shirts, fabrics, and they have our official logo on them. That's what makes them special in multiple sizes and colors. We even have stuff for children, stuff for women, stuff for men. We have all sorts of sizes, like small up to X large. A lot of good stuff. That's the swag from the Paracast. If you go to store.theparacast.com, stop by and take a shopping tour. Heart-related health problems affect millions of people each year. Maybe you're one of the many who suffer from issues related to angina pain, high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, unbalanced cholesterol, irregular heartbeat, or clogged arteries. There is a solution that doesn't involve expensive prescription drugs that only mask the problem and leave you with horrible side effects. If you are ready to live your life free of sickness, pain, and fear, live your life with increased vitality, energy, and youthfulness, and experience your body healing itself, then you're ready for heart and body extract from Healthy Hearts Club. Here is what one satisfied customer had to say about heart and body extract regarding his angina pain. I haven't had an angina pain since I've been on it. The heart body extract is just so great. I thank God that I was led to this product that's doing so much for me and that can do so much for other people. Call to order your two-month supply of heart and body extract today. Call 1-866-295-5305 or go to hbextract.com. Get the ultimate knife at an ultimate price. The Fox Karambit Knife. Finally available in the U.S. The Fox Karambit Knife opens with one hand. Faster than you can pull a handgun. For utility, for defense, and for way less than other knives of this caliber. Go to TheUltimateKnife.com. Truly the best knife you will ever own. And only available at TheUltimateKnife.com. Use promo code RADIO at checkout for free shipping. Get the ultimate knife at the ultimate price at TheUltimateKnife.com. Policies issued by American General Life Insurance Company, Houston, Texas. Not available in all states. For details, visit AIGdirect.com. If you're young and healthy, you don't need life insurance, right? Yeah, that's what I used to think, too, until my brother died at 38. Joe left his wife with two kids, a mortgage, and a stack of bills she couldn't pay. Mary had to sell the house and move everybody into this tiny two-bedroom apartment just to make ends meet. I never want to do that to my wife, so I got life insurance. I called AIG Direct and was really surprised how affordable it is. Just $14 a month for $250,000 of term life coverage. Listen, if you have a family, you should seriously think about getting life insurance. You'll feel a lot better having it. Trust me. Call AIG Direct for a free no-obligation quote. The call takes less than five minutes, and you could save up to 70%. Call now, 1-800-910-7981. That's 1-800-910-7981. 1-800-910-7981. It's a no-brainer. A Big Berkey water filter is the one you need, period. You need a water filter that removes chlorine, fluoride, pharmaceuticals, BPA, and other endocrine disruptors, pesticides, bacteria, viruses, and much more, right? And does it all at only two cents per gallon. Get the original and most trusted name in gravity water filtration, Big Berkey. And now GCN listeners receive 5% off ceramic filter systems using code GCN. Call or click 1-877-99-BERKEY or BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. That's 1-877-99-BERKEY. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Richard Bonenfant is joining us. He's certainly a medical researcher, and we're talking about his interest in cattle mutilations and also we'll get into near-death experiences later. I want to ask him a lot about that. Okay, key question here, Richard. With regard to cattle mutilations, what you're describing to me sounds sophisticated, but nothing that we can't do on Earth, right? Uh, I'm afraid I disagree with that. I think that a lot of things that are being done to cattle, we cannot reproduce in the laboratory or in a clinical setting, or I don't think we have some of this technology. Uh, to do this. Uh, I can give you an example. For example, uh, foxes have been found in in Great Britain with a small hole in their head about the size of a dime. And 
the brain matter within the skull has been drawn out of the fox completely so that when you do a necropsy, which is basically an autopsy on an animal, uh, and you open the skull, you find that the brains, are, the brain matter is all gone. And um, I'm not sure, I, I'm, I wouldn't bet my life on it, but I'm, sure, I'm not sure that we are capable of doing something like that. You know, that there could be some specialists who would challenge me, but I can't understand how we, we could possibly do that. And there are other way, other things that, uh, that are being done. Uh, for example, drawing internal organs out of small portals, circular hole, holes through the skin through which they puncture the, the body and they, whisk, they take out internal organs. Uh, sometimes they do it through the rectum, which is called anal cor- coring. That's very, uh, very bizarre too, because they they draw out the colon and the intestines, and sometimes the reproductive organs through these these small holes. Uh, I don't know if we could do that. We may be able to do that, but I'm not sure. And uh, there are other things that are uh, just a little bit beyond our technology, especially when we first heard about it, which was in the 1960s when Linda Moulton House started to do research on mutilated animals. Uh, at that time, we, we didn't have portable lasers or any instrumentation that could be taken out in the field and used on animals that way. At least we didn't have uh, them in civilian use. I, I know that the military had some experimental lasers back then, but... Uh... Yeah, so I, I, I mean, it, I if you're talking, I don't think they were that small or portable. Uh, the one that they had were like rifle size, and they required a big battery pack. You would have to be, if it was portable, you'd have to have something like that, or you'd have to have some sort of a, a mobile lab at the very least. So, I mean, if you're talking about they, whoever they are, if we're not just assuming some sort of predation, has to be using some sort of comparatively high technology. Well. You're correct. We've, we've really made a lot of progress in laser size and miniaturization of some of our instrumentation, but there are other factors around this which uh, would kind of make it that difficult uh, in, in the historical times because, you know, these animals are found out in the field or out in a patch of snow or uh, sometimes in the backyard just yards away from the, a person's uh, barn or home, uh, there's never any sound to alert them that a mutilation is going on. And when uh, people, when the police investigate the, the site of the mutilation, they never can find any tracks, even in the snow, even in, in mud fields or in areas that are easy tracking. They never find any indication of a struggle in which the animal was running around and trying to avoid being captured, or did they never find any kind of footprints or tire prints, or, um, you know, like if you had a helicopter, you'd have to have helicopter skid marks or something like that, but they never find any kind of tracks. It's, it's so, just um, as if they were dropped, dropped out of the sky. Right. So, so um, these are, in these cases, these are the, the, um, the, the small percentage of, of very unusual cases that we're talking about here, it's sort of like if um, I'm a bit out of my depth in terms of the mutilation side of things, I'm more a ufologist, but in ufology, mm-hmm. we have you know so many cases that are fairly easily explained by something mundane, but then we have this residue of a very small number that are just too weird and defy explanation. So... What sort of percentages are you looking at when we're talking about the kind of mutilations you just mentioned? Well, you know, they're not all mutilated exactly in the same way. It varies somewhat. Uh, But let's just uh, draw the circle a little tighter and we talk about bovine mutilations, which are basically uh, cattle mutilations. Um, Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll focus it on that because that's representative of other types of uh, mutilations. Um, these these uh, mutilations are r- repeated not only here in the Southwest and in the West, or they're in Florida, they're in almost, almost all the states. 
And they're also found in Europe, in Australia, South America, Brazil, Argentina. They're found in almost, well, there are a, a, a large range of countries that that have uh, good communication, so we know that they've happened. We sometimes can only pick them up through uh, newspaper reports or radio reports, but um, these are happening not only here in the United States where we do have quite a sophisticated technology, but in areas that have very little technology. Uh, in the outback of Australia, for example, or in the Argentine cattle fields, uh, they don't seem to have as much access to high technology as we do. So I don't think that explanation of we have their, the technology to do that uh, would hold. Um, and uh, whenever the police have investigated these, these sightings, uh, they, they usually uh, attribute them to predation or some, some bizarre explanation that wouldn't make any sense to a scientist. Uh, they don't really have a, um, a culprit. And in all the years of animal mutilation, which dates back to the, the, recent, the recent ones, date back to the 1960s, no one has ever been charged with the crime of animal mutilation. Nobody has ever been captured in the act. There's no record of uh, cults uh, being able, uh, getting away with doing this, and they've been studied as well by the police and, and uh, investigative authorities from the federal government. So to attribute them um, to our advanced technology or to some covert agency that has high technology it is still a stretch in my in my view. Again, we're talking about a, a small percent of the overall number of dead animals that are found on, on a ranch. Like say, if you've got a couple thousand cases, how many of those would we be truly strange enough to exhibit these types of characteristics? Maybe Let's have the answer in our two. next segment with Richard and with Randall. You're in the Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. If you like alkaline water or know someone that does, you're going to love the Dillon Living Water Bottle. It creates alkaline water on the go while reducing plastic waste and saving you money. Made with surgical grade stainless steel, the Dillon Bottle increases the pH up to 9 to deliver both alkaline and antioxidant water anywhere you want it. Alkaline water is healthier, tastes better, and can even boost energy. The Dillon Bottle makes it easy and affordable to be healthy and achieve optimal hydration. Get your Dillon Bottle today at dyln.co. That's dyln.co. Hi, I'm Dan Pilla. I started fighting the IRS over 40 years ago when they tried to seize my mother's house. I sued the IRS and won. I beat the IRS then, and I've been beating them ever since. I wrote the book on tax debt settlement, and I've helped thousands of people deal with tax problems they thought might never be solved. I can help you too. If you owe taxes you can't pay, don't wait another day. There's no such thing as a hopeless tax case. Call 800-34-NO-TAX or go to my website, danpilla.com. That's danpilla.com, danpilla.com. For USA Radio News, I'm Wendy King. Airport officials say the ground service agent who stole an empty plane from a Seattle airport had legitimate access to it before taking off and later crashing. The man, Richard Russell, apparently didn't have a pilot's license. Authorities say it's not clear how he got the skills to do loops in the aircraft before crashing about an hour after taking off and smashing into a small island in the Puget Sound. Former National Transportation Safety Board Chairman Mark Rosenker. He did say he had spent a lot of time with video games. There are video games that deal with a simulation of this aircraft. Gary Beck is CEO of Horizon Air. His job is to be around airplanes. The airports have a non-secure side and a secure side. He's meant to be on the secure side. That's part of the fulfillment of uh, his job responsibility. You're listening to USA Radio News. Balance of Nature's Fruits and Veggies in a Capsule. 
I went to have my blood test done a few weeks ago, and I met the doctor, and he was really encouraged by my progress, and I showed him what I was taking, and he started looking at all the ingredients, and he said, I'm really impressed with the shiitake mushroom, <laughs> and he said, this stuff, it could clean out your arteries, and I'm like, oh, wow. He said, you may be onto something here, and he said, you just keep that up, and maybe you can start cutting back on your medication, and he says, you're, you're helping your health by doing that. I'm like, whoa, endorsement by the doctor. (laughs) When you call, use discount code USA and we'll take 35% off your first month's order and ship it to you free. Call 800-246-8751. That's 1-800-246-8751 or go online to balanceofnature.com and use discount code USA. You haven't experienced yogurt until you've tried a Mossy, embodying health and flavor in a true whole milk, green-fed dairy beverage. Every sip pays homage to our old world cows and the ancient culturing methods their milk benefits from. With over 30 probiotics, a Mossy's undeniably nutritious, refined, cultured sensation bolsters your health and awakens your passion for dairy. A Mossy's so good, and you need to try it. Contact your Longevity distributor or call 877-878-4203 or go to GCNteam.com. Kiss your credit card debt goodbye. I'm Pharmacist Keith, Dr. Wallach, the Dead Doctors Don't Lie guy, and myself want to show you how to achieve financial peace, creating an extra income that will last for years to come by joining Dr. Wallach's crusade, spreading his message of better health. To learn more, visit radio.recordedvideo.com. That's radio.recordedvideo.com, radio.recordedvideo.com, or call 866-257-3105 for a recorded message. This is Marie D. Jones, the author of This Book is from the Future, and you are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Richard Bonnenfant and J. Randall Murphy, and we're talking about cattle mutilations from a different point of view, I think, than what we've talked about with... Chris O'Brien, because Chris emphasized his feeling that this was all due to conventional causes. But if so, who would be doing it? Cultists? What? Well, you know, the conventional explanations are either animals are doing it or humans are doing it. And if animals are doing it, you have to basically count on predators, which are animals of prey that would prey on cattle, or, or scavengers, which would. Uh, attack the remains of a sick or dead cow. And um, I don't think any sane pathologist would uh, concede mutilations were done by scavengers or predators, even though they have, veterinarians have reported that. I don't have faith that those reports are accurate. I think if you want to actually try to get information from veterinary reports, you're more likely to get an accurate report by going to some other country. It would appear that there's some force or some effort being made to, I guess, cal- calm down the, the strangeness of these mutilations in the public press. I guess what I'm trying uh, to get a, a feel for here is what percentage of all the cases where some animal is found lying dead in in a field or whatever the case may be turns out to be something truly strange are you suggesting that most of them are in fact truly strange i would suggest that most of the ones that we think of as being mutilations are not only strange they're unexplainable and i know that i'm in a minority with this i think well, I don't know. If, I haven't taken a, you know, any kind of study to see how many people would decide with me, but I know that uh, at least uh, a couple of people would. For example, Ted Oliphant III has made some publications in which he also sees a relationship between animal mutilations and uh, prion diseases. He differs with me in that he feels that it is the U.S. government that's doing it, and he does that primarily uh, based on his experience uh, 
examining the cows uh, and black and the presence of black helicopters around sites where where these cows were being mutilated and um and then there's uh like Colm uh, Kelleher who wrote a book called Brain Trust uh who also may side on the agency being a covert government agency I'm probably the only one who's attributing them to UFOs, but that's in the context of, I guess, a, a more professional uh, viewpoint. I think the public and uh, the general public may accept the explanations that these are done by scavengers or cultists or something else, but uh, I don't agree with that, and I would hold that if you take this to a veterinarian who's being unbiased, I, I would say he would say either I don't know what did it, it's unexplainable, or he, he would defer his, his judgment uh, to the unknown because uh, these are really bizarre things. Let's carry on then with this connection then between the prion disease and this uh, a shadowy force, whatever it is that is performing uh, the deed. So yeah. what have we got? What, what can we deduce? Or is there anything that we can sort of extrapolate from, from the evidence on this? What's your theory? Oh, well, you know, the evidence all points to uh, the, the largest uh, focus evidence indicates that these cattle are being mutilated to determine the extent of the, prion, the spread of prion diseases in both the domestic and wild populations of mammals. So in other words, this is an epidemiological study at a very high level. And I don't disagree with Oliphant or um, Kelleher that the U.S. Uh, US agencies, either the military or some private agency, is involved in these mutilations. I think there's a very good chance that they're doing that. But there's two different levels of technology here. Uh, one of them is trying to emulate the, the, the most weird type, and, and they're kind of like following through, maybe looking for the same thing, because prion diseases are something very, very scary and something that the press and the people responsible are very um, shy about talking about. Basically, we're we're talking for the just for lay people. We're talking about mad cow disease, essentially. Yeah, well, mad cow disease is only one variant that causes these uh, prion diseases. You know, there's the uh, famil fatal uh, familial insomnia, which is caused by prion diseases. But there's a couple other uh, diseases. About the one you're talking about is something called Creutzfeldt Jakob disease, CJD, that's the one is called mad cow disease. But mad cow disease is, is transferable. Those, those prions have mutated and crossed the species barrier. So that's what happened in England when they had the mad cow disease. Several years after they had eliminated all the cows, people came down in their 20s and 30s with Alzheimer's disease, well, what they considered Alzheimer's disease. But when they did further studies, they found that it was related to Alzheimer's disease, but it was it was affecting people who had eaten uh, tainted beef from the, 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 the cows that had been destroyed. They got into the food chain. And I think there was a push to uh, by the meat industry to quiet things down and, and not cause a panic because it affected their trade. The one that I was referring to is bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Encephalopathy. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Right. So, right. and okay. that's the one that they say can transfer between cows and humans if, uh, if no, you're no, eating no. the tainted meat. No. Bovine spongiform encephalopathy caused mad cow disease. That, that's the, that's the, um, the version that infects cows. But when uh, when it infects cows, it mutates, and sometimes the mutations jump species barriers. It's not easy to do that, but they break all the rules of, of uh, epidemiology. They you know they don't have any genetic material. It's just a, a protein, and we don't know the function of the protein, but it mutates 
in different animals and it sometimes jumps through the species barrier. So bovine spongiform encephalitis caused Creutzfeldt Jacob disease, which was a, a different a, pre, a different prion disease. And there are probably over a hundred different uh, prion diseases. Different animals, they give them a different name. In deer and elk, they call it chronic waste disease. In sheep, they call it scrapey. There's a fatal insomnia. It doesn't seem like it has something to do with prions, but that's a prion disease. And there's, you know, a mink transmissible encephalopathy. There's a large number of different versions of this out there. And what's, what's so scary is that this disease, this prion disease, was re- usually confined to mil- milk or very, very rarely in the human population so that we didn't really understand what it was. We just grouped it with Alzheimer's disease. And as you know, the rate of Alzheimer's disease has increased dramatically over the past two decades. It's affecting a lot more people. Sometimes the Creutzfeldt jacob disease, which is the version of mad cow disease in human beings, is mistaken for Alzheimer's disease. If you take an autopsy of the brains of people who have Alzheimer's disease and you try to find out how many have the version that affects human beings, you might find only a small portion. But those studies that have done that have only taken small, small numbers of population with Rick and with Randall, you're in the Paracast. You are listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Do you need a website? Well, you can get a great deal on hosting services with Namecheap's legendary coupon code. They're offering substantial hosting discounts on shared hosting, business hosting, VPS hosting, reseller hosting, and even dedicated servers. Namecheap is preferred by millions. It's backed by a money-back guarantee. Use the coupon code LEGENDARY to cash in on the special deal at Namecheap.com, Namecheap.com. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. Get the ultimate knife at an ultimate price. The Fox Karambit Knife. Finally available in the U.S. The Fox Karambit Knife opens with one hand. Faster than you can pull a handgun. For utility, for defense, and for way less than other knives of this caliber. Go to TheUltimateKnife.com. Truly the best knife you will ever own. And only available at TheUltimateKnife.com. Use promo code RADIO at checkout for free shipping. Get the ultimate knife at the ultimate price at TheUltimateKnife.com. Most of you know that heart disease is the number one silent killer in the U.S. What if I told you for just $54.95 a month you could fight against heart disease naturally? At Heart and Body Extract, we've been helping thousands of people get back to a healthier heart. Don't just take my word for it. Check out all of the success stories at hbextract.com. Or to order, call 866-295-5305. That's 866-295-5305. hbextract.com. Don't risk it when you can take charge of it. Get the ultimate knife at an ultimate price. The Fox Karambit Knife. Finally available in the U.S. The Fox Karambit Knife opens with one hand. Faster than you can pull a handgun. For utility, for defense, and for way less than other knives of this caliber. Go to TheUltimateKnife.com. Truly the best knife you will ever own. And only available at TheUltimateKnife.com. Use promo code RADIO at checkout for free shipping. Get the ultimate knife at the ultimate price. At TheUltimateKnife.com. If you owe money to the IRS, you need to hear this. The IRS is cracking down on those who owe back taxes. It starts with a devastating letter. And if you don't act immediately, you could find yourself having your wages garnished or have a lien placed on your property. But there's a solution. Tax 10,000 can help. Avoid enforced compliance, where these holds on your income and seizure of your home could become a nightmare that just won't end. 
Call 800-239-9957 now and speak to one of our experts. 800-239-9957 is the number to link you directly to a tax resolution specialist who will negotiate with the IRS on your behalf. Working through the IRS Fresh Start program, all the forms will be handled for you. All you have to do is make the toll-free call. 800-239-9957. Find out if you qualify and possibly save yourself thousands of dollars, not to mention a lot of headaches. It could be the best call you've made today. That number again, 800-239-9957. The service does not provide tax settlement or legal services. We will refer you to a company that does provide such services. Often the IRS will not agree to any reduction in the amount owed. Not all taxpayers who owe more than $10,000 will qualify for a tax reduction program. This is Jessica Armand, creator of the fluoride-free oral care brand, My Magic Mud. You're going to love our new products. Our cutting-edge oral rinses deeply soothe your mouth and fight cavities naturally. Our breath spray, My Magic Mist, will invigorate your senses with essential oils of peppermint and eucalyptus. Our clinically proven toothpaste and tooth powders whiten your teeth and detoxify your mouth. Buy discounted bundles direct at MyMagicMud.com and take 10% off with coupon code GCN10. MyMagicMud.com. Hi, this is Bryce Abel. I'm the producer of Dark Skies, the co-author of AD After Disclosure, and you are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. With Randall and with Richard, I'm Gene Steinberg. Let's continue with a fascinating discussion about these various conditions and animal mutilations. Go ahead, please, Randall. Yeah, well, we were just talking about the effect of these prions, which are, they're, they're not, as Richard was saying, your normal protein cells in your body. They're made of amino acids, but they tend to wrap around the normal cells in your brain and nervous system and clamp them off and cause holes and cause a degenerative disease. So these are really, really tiny, tiny things at, at the molecular level. So is there any indication, Richard, where these things have come from to begin with? Uh, no, uh, whatever it is, it's something that we innately have. But like cancer, sometimes there's a mutation and that mutation is transferred by one means or another, either by ingestion or by air. Or, But unlike other infectious diseases, um, we usually have a protection when we have different species. And sometimes the prions need to go through two or three different mutation stages before they can infect, for, for example, human beings. So uh, in prions, the earliest known infections were with sheep, and they call that disease scrapie. Scrapie in sheep was basically Alzheimer's in sheep, but at an accelerated rate. Somehow, maybe through uh, uh, feeding ground-up sheep to cows for protein, they get transferred to cows, and cows became infected with what we call mad cow disease, which is a cow version of Alzheimer's. But from that point there, as the disease spread to many, many cows, thousands and thousands of cows that had to be destroyed because they had this disease, there was a, a push not to make the, the general population, it, it started in England, to, to make them not panic. So a lot of people in the government and in the media ate hamburgers and encouraged people to keep eating meat. And as a result of that, maybe three or four years after the mad cow disease, people in their 20s started coming down with uh, a new version, which is called Kreutzfeldt. Jakob encephalopathy, and that disease is mad cow in people. So there were many cases, I don't know, maybe 28 or 30 documented cases of people having contracted mad cow disease through eating tainted meat products from cows. And that was the alarm for the epidemiologists. And they struggled very hard to, uh, to eradicate the, the disease in, in cows and to assure the public that they had taken care of the problem. However, the problem wasn't taken care of. As a matter of fact, 
we didn't really understand enough about prions to know they're almost indestructible. Uh, you can take a prion and put it in an autoclave, which is uh, like a microwave they use to clean medical instruments, and it won't kill the prions. And if you have body fluids that contain prions, like from deer or something, and they drop into the soil, they'll remain virulent for years, and they can infect anybody who eats grass from that soil or, or who somehow come in contact with that soil. It seems to me that I recall some claims being made that uh, the prions themselves can be destroyed using a high volume hydrogen peroxide and that there was hydrogen peroxide treatments that were taking place and they were having some success with that. Did you recall any of that? I'm not familiar with that. I'm sorry. I must have missed it. But okay. from what I understand from reading the medical literature, uh, these are they're almost made of kryptonite, these proteins. The problem with the protein is that once you get infected with one of these prion proteins, they convert normal proteins into mutant variety. So it's almost like they, they create zombies by being in contact. So a normal protein comes in contact with a prion protein. They change into a prion protein. And it's like a deck of cards or like, you know, dominoes. They just go from one to the other until in a matter of years or months, they can destroy a person's memory or his coordination or his... Uh, it, uh, yeah. It infects the, the people so severely that everybody who, who comes infected with a prion disease dies. It, it's fatal. It, you know, it's just a matter of time. The difference between Alzheimer's and these prion-related diseases is that normally in Alzheimer's, the incubation time may be years, maybe 10, 20 years, but with the prion-related diseases, they're more virulent. So they can become ill and die within a matter of months or, or years at the most. There's no question it's dangerous, and it's scary stuff for anyone who you know, values their workings of their own mind. So yes. if this is being studied by some shadowy uh, force, it sounds like it's something that could be weaponized, or is it... What is the motivation behind it, then? I mean, well, is there any is there any clue to that? Well, I don't know if it's been, been intentionally done, but uh, when the disease was first discovered, its name was Kuru, and it was a uh, degenerative brain disease among, among a tribe called the Mari in, in, in uh, Papua um, New Guinea, and. Uh, uh, yeah, there's uh, several scientists, some from Australia and some from the United States, who went to study the disease. And when they were there, they sent samples. They tried to find out what in the diet was causing that. And they sent samples of blood, of brain tissue, and actually of whole brains to Bethesda, Maryland, where they were analyzed. And uh, the, 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 the infectious part was was uh, tested to see how virulent it was by being uh, injected into monk, uh, into chimpanzees and other forms of uh, zoo life that they had in a, zoo, a wildlife zoo somewhere in Maryland. And in that process, they may have infected many different species that got away from the compound and spread the disease. So uh, we know that it's spread by ingestion. And we, we don't really know what other ways it can be spread, but it hasn't been studied enough to know. But we do know that since the 1950s or so, when we first were aware of the Kuru disease, it has crossed the species barrier into cows and then from cows into people, into mink, into elk, into deer, uh, and maybe into many other animals as well. And the reason that I connect alien intervention in this is because these mutilations really began in the 1960s, and they were so sophisticated that I don't think we had any instrumentation capable of carrying out those mutilations. It was very sophisticated. And 
And I think that in the process of trying to uh, find out what these mutilations were, that our government became aware of their purpose. And in trying to catch up and to emulate what perhaps the aliens have been doing, they are also involved in similar activities to uh, and, and similar studies to try to carry out epidemiological studies to find out the extent that this is spreading, uh, you know, the speed and the extent and the range that this is spreading throughout the world. Okay, so then so, we've got, what we've got is, uh, we've got two factions here, you're saying. We've got the, uh, essentially, we've got us with our scientists trying to figure out the problem. And this well, other... That, that's, a, I, that's a hypothesis. That's, well, that's well, we, I, well, I guess, yeah. Well, that well, no, I think that's pretty obvious. We do have groups of our own, our own scientists, human scientists that are studying the problem in labs and trying to figure it out. I don't, I don't think there's any question about that. the The question we have is this other sort of shadowy group, whether they're aliens or something else that seem to be involved with it. So, um, what do you think is happening here? Are our people going around and chasing after the? The, the particular cases, high strange cases, to see what the aliens are doing, or is it something separate? You know what, folks, let's do our break now, because this involves a long answer from Rick. So it's Gene, Rick, and Randall. Indeed, you're in the Paracast. <laughs> for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a thrill a minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors. Classic science fiction at its best. Available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R O C K O I D S dot com. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-261-9818 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-261-9818. Again, 800-261-9818. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. First part of this episode, the Paracast is focusing very heavily on animal mutilations. Richard Bonenfant and our Weekly co-host Jay Randall Murphy and Richard feels that there's some ET intervention in there. And just as a contrast for regular listeners, we know, of course, that our own Chris O'Brien, the former co-host of the Paracast, he looked for a more terrestrial solution in his book, Stalking the Herd. Randall, you want to pick up on that? Right. We were talking about 
to different groups that are involved in this. So we're not just talking exclusively about aliens or our own medical researchers. Is there also some maybe other third terrestrial sort of shadowy force involved here? And and why don't we see them coming out, say, when somebody reports a, a cattle mutilation? Why don't we see somebody, say, from the Department of Defense or the CDC out there then, if that's the case, uh, trying to figure out what's going on? Well, I think the person who best answers that is Colm Kelleher, which I, I, I don't know if you've had him on your show, but he's a microbiologist from Trinity College in Ireland who's been studying this this problem for quite a while. And he blames complacency in the American media and the American health system, like the CDC, for undermining the seriousness of this epidemic. And I agree with him. I think that we are taking it seriously at the military, and maybe the CDC is taking it seriously, but they're doing the studies covertly, and we're not getting any of the results. Now, that may be because they feel it's oh, <laughs> a, a national problem that, that would be difficult to handle, but the Europeans have handled it out in the open. They, they've been very straightforward about uh, inspecting meat, and the Japanese are very forward about it. I don't know why we don't have more serious coverage of, for example, herds of uh, elk or a deer that are found dead in, in various places throughout the country. And they just maybe said that, you know, a herd of elk were found all dead in a certain area. But we don't know if they died of prion diseases or what. And there's no explanation and there's no follow up. I've actually seen those articles where they have said it has been some sort of uh, prion disease in elk herds. But like you say, it tends to be buried. And you have to, I've never seen it in the papers. I have seen it in independent articles on the internet, but you really got to dig for it. I mean, they're that's, there. That's correct. That's correct. You're absolutely right. And that's what I'm trying to get at. There are people who are really dedicated. And as a matter of fact, the prisoner won a Nobel Prize for his work on discovering what the prions were. But it's not really covered in proportion to its seriousness. And I think in that regard, it's been because of the complacency of our health authorities. This is something that should be covered, and it should be, we should be inspecting meat much more carefully. We inspect a very small percentage, maybe only 2% of the, of the cows that are, that are being slaughtered. And we think, uh, the, at first we thought that only the cows that, that couldn't stand or had uh, problems walking were contaminated cows, but the most recent cow uh, epidemic up in Washington State was with a standing cow that didn't have any other symptoms, and it was discovered that it had uh, it had uh, the mad cow disease. So, you know, we should be inspecting more cows, and we should inspect them more thoroughly. I think that the Europeans and the Japanese are really far in advance of our own, but they don't they don't treat it as something that would be a, a national uh, problem. They, they treat it as a national concern. And uh, I think part of the problem is that we're not aware of, the, pop the general population is not aware of the seriousness of these prion diseases. I know that here in Canada, we do have uh, inspections for this. And I remember it being in the news. And uh, right now, actually, since 2007, Canada has been recognized as a uh, what's called a controlled BSE risk country. Uh, and in the States, it seems like they, there's so much more uh, of an industry there that it's harder to regulate and inspect. So from what I recall, is has a lot to do with the type of feed that they were giving to the cows because they, were, they discovered that uh, they were actually feeding cows back to themselves as food, and they were cooking them in this high temperature and one theory was that, that this was breaking down the protein into these amino strands that would sort of spontaneously form this prion in the food chain. And since they've cut that out, there's been a big decline in the incidence of it. And, and yet now it's out in the wild. And what do we do? Right. The process you're, calling, you're describing is called rendering. 
And that's when uh, wheat cows or cows that can't make it to market are sent to a factory where they destroy the cow, they grind up the meat, and they turn it into protein feed, which they give back to the cow. And, and in a sense, they're just transmitting, retransmitting the, the prions back into the cow population by grinding up, by grinding up contaminated cows or, or uh, other. But the thing is, uh, for example, uh, you, if you have feed for cows to supplement the, their, their intake of hay and things, if you, if you feed them these, this, this rendered um, uh, meal or, or pellets or something, that sometimes uh, animals that are not cows will go into the pasture and eat these, these pellets as well, perhaps deer, raccoon, uh, coyotes, whatever. Uh, you know, they might just go and feed on that. And some of them may produce uh, mutations in which they now carry the disease and spread it to other animals. And I think that's what happened in the deer and the elk population. Part of the problem seems is that there's no real validated live animal test for BSE. It has to be done uh, in an autopsy type setting where uh, the animal is actually destroyed, their brain and, and uh, nervous system that could be infected has to be taken out and examined very carefully under high powered magnification. You're absolutely right. And that's why a lot of the pathologists in California won't examine Alzheimer's brains because they're afraid of contaminating their instruments or themselves and in the process of determining what, if it was Alzheimer's or if it was a prion-related disease, there's a reluctance to deal with that. And they just group these deaths under, uh, you know, mental uh, deterioration in Alzheimer's. And so they, they bury it. And we don't know what percentage of the people who die from Alzheimer's may have the human version of mad cow disease, and they're mistaking it, or they're not refined enough to determine how how much it's changed over time. So I suspect that the increase in Alzheimer's over the past two decades may conceal uh, a lot of prion diseases, an increase in prion diseases, especially when it occurs in the younger ages, say from the 20s on. Normally, Alzheimer's occurs later on in life, like when you're 60s and 70s, but the more virulent version of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease occurs, you know, to teen, well, almost to teenagers, but to young adults in their 20s, and they don't live for more than a year and a half. Those cases should all be examined and, and verified as being whatever they are you know well then again of course so but this presents a real problem for us then in that gene had mentioned chris christopher o'brien uh who is very well known on our forums here and on the show and has written pretty much the definitive book on the subject and one of the questions he's asking is is uh to, to sort of frame this question is that do you think that coordinating mutilation research and investigation is at all possible when reporters and researchers such as Linda Howe and Chuck Zukowski tend to promote the idea that it's only aliens that are responsible for all mutilations. We got more to come on the animal mutilation subject a little bit later. It's going to be near death experiences. Got a lot of questions about that for Rick. We've got Randall and Jean, and that means you're in the Paracast. Neighbors, we've made such a deal with HelloFresh, and it means that everyone listening to this show can receive $30 off your first week of deliveries when you go to HelloFresh.com and use the offer code PARACAST30. You know, with HelloFresh, you can choose the delivery day that works best for you. They've got a wide variety of chef-curated recipes that change weekly. And can you imagine me cooking Japanese panko chicken. It makes me feel like I'm a chef. It means also that you could actually get your meal cooked in 30 minutes. For busy people, this is perfect. The simple recipes include step-by-step -step instructions so even I can figure it out. Go to HelloFresh.com, use the offer code PARACAST30, 
to get $30 off your first week of deliveries, HelloFresh.com. It's been said, any society is only three missed meals away from chaos. Those times may be near. Think about it. Our country faces multiple terrorist threats and aggressions from Russia and North Korea. Social unrest and violent marches yet again may lead to looting of stores and city shutdowns. And our crumbling infrastructure leaves our power grid vulnerable to long-term outages from a single cyber attack. When the chaos from any one of these threats arises, the government knows it can't provide during a widespread national emergency. That's why you need your own plan for self-reliance. That's where My Patriot Supply comes in. Get a four-week survival food supply for only $99. That includes breakfast, lunches, and dinners. Order online at preparewithgcn.com. $99 for four weeks of survival food that tastes like homemade cooking and lasts up to 25 years from My Patriot Supply. Get your kits today at preparewithgcn.com. Free shipping is included. Preparewithgcn.com. Ted Anderson telling you about Jordan Rubin's Beyond Organic Green-Fed Raw Cheddar Artesian Cheese featuring whole milk created through ancient dairy breeding, unpasteurized, untreated whole milk on the same farm the cows graze, containing natural sources of omega-3s, CLA protein, calcium, probiotics, and enzymes. I have never tasted cheese this good, and you need to try it. Contact your Longevity distributor or call 877-878-4203 or go to GCNteam.com. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-261-9818 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-261-9818. Again, 800-261-9818. Healthcare reform is confusing, but whether it's finding an affordable insurance plan, keeping your doctor, or being able to afford needed prescriptions, navigating the healthcare system has become a challenge. Control your own healthcare costs and choices with Liberty HealthShare. Liberty HealthShare is not insurance. It is an association of self-pay patients who unite with like-minded people to share the cost of each other's medical needs. Neighbor helping neighbor. Learn more now by going to libertyoncall.org. That's libertyoncall.org. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. So, Randall, you asked Rick a kind of lengthy question there, and I guess focusing on the possibility that some of the guilty parties in these animal mutilations or et would you go on with that question please right yeah i'll just uh reframe that because i didn't do a very good job of it before the break do you think that coordinating mutilation research and investigation is at all possible when reporters and researchers such as linda howe or chuck zakowski tend to promote the idea that it can only be aliens that are responsible for all mutilations now chris puts that in quotes and says they won't have anything to do with researchers whose investigations have come to other conclusions. Now, if we've got that going on in the non-professional field, so to speak, and in civilian science research, how are people in actual science going to take it seriously? I mean, what are we supposed to, how are we supposed to convince them that they should be doing this because aliens are, are researching prion disease in cows and humans? How do we make any progress? Because on either side of the equation, it seems like people are going to be really shying away from any sort of research that has anything to do with it. Well, I think you run into a different kind of a problem, but one having to do with human beings. It seems like uh, we all develop prejudices, and uh, we don't really sit down and talk 
um, let me say, professionally with one another with regards to any problem. I mean, I think that people could co coordinate themselves and work uh, if they could agree to listen to the other side and to address what, whatever problems that are proposed from, the, from whatever critic you're listening to. For example, Joe Bryan could, you know, listen to people who claim that it's done by aliens and explain their point, their arguments as to why they believe that's true and the vice versa, the other person, is true. I happen to think that both aliens and humans are working on these things, but at different levels. Well, let me ask you a quick question here because you're raising that, and I want to try to get a movement on this because we want to switch to another topic later. That is, yep. you feel that at least some of these mutilations are caused by alien intervention. How do we know they're oh, yeah, alien, oh, yeah. and how do we know they're terrestrial? Well, for example, I don't know if you're familiar with the Judy and Dorothy abduction, but in the Judy and Dorothy abduction, which was uh, published in um, one of Linda Moulton's house first production, uh, or first uh, publications, and it was, I think, in one of the appendices, maybe Appendix 12, where this woman who was uh, abducted, she and her daughter were abducted. Uh, before they were abducted, they, they saw a brown and white calf being raised up in a tractor beam of yellow light into a UFO. And then there's a gap in their memory, and they're in the UFO. And the a woman's daughter, Judy's daughter, I think her name was Cindy, finds herself on an examining table. But the mother is in a room where uh, an actual vivisection is taking place by the aliens. And in that scene, she reports that the cow is alive and he has all these tubes being put into it somehow. And material is coming out of these tubes and they're coming into basins. Just a moment here, guys. They're torturing this animal. I mean, I guess we can say yeah. you're torturing the animal when you eat it. But something like this here is, this is, I guess, part and parcel of alien, so-called alien abductions, where they administer physical exams and they're none too nice about it. Yes, they don't ask the cow's approval. They don't ask the human's approval. They just do it. Well, obviously, with the cow, it's more difficult. It's just a matter of observing some humanity. But if we're going to take animals and harvest them for food you know that's not very different but we like to hope that aliens coming down here would be nice to the humans at least well i think that they have a different agenda and i think that the infection of the the entire biosphere with infectious prions may not be in their interest as well so i think they have a vested stake in what they're doing no, they don't ask permission, and what they do is cruel. And I have no excuse for, for this type of thing myself. I, I see this as just animal cruelty. But the fact is that these things are happening, and we just can't ignore it, uh, is that most of these cows that are taken, and they're mostly cows, not bulls, but most of them that are taken are between uh, one and five years old, and they seem to be concentrating on sometimes on the pregnant female cows, and they're interested in the younger cows, and they're focusing their attention mostly on them. And I think that there's something important being studied because all of the genital uh, parts of the animal are very scrupulously taken and studied, and I think that they're, they're examining the potential for uh, reproductive contamination. So I want to make a point that this is in fact, animal cruelty and what they do to human beings is no, no different. It's just psychological cruelty. And, and there's no permission asked or given, you know, this is something that happens without consent. And there's, on my part or whoever is studying this, it should be clear that this is animal mutilation in the brutalist form. Maybe they're just looking I mean, at it the way the uh, people in the labs you mentioned were uh, giving this disease to apes and monkeys exactly. and chimpanzees. I, I mean, they're I, the sentient creatures. Right. There's a sense of hubris in this and that, you know, we, 
and they also are doing things from this position of superiority almost. Yeah, we're, and, we're down uh, one in the food chain now all of a sudden, it seems like. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. But anyway, I think what I was saying is that there are people who have been abducted who have actually witnessed these things. And also, yes, there are black helicopters that that are found in the vicinity of, of mutilated cows and often people like in uniforms, uh, non-descript uniforms that are doing things. But there are also a much larger number of cases where UFOs are, are seen in the vicinity and, um, and are kind of linked with the animal mutilations as well. I'm sorry, go ahead. It's okay, finish that sentence. You were saying you wouldn't challenge Chris's no, I think that uh, I think that there are military and maybe uh, covert health agencies involved in cattle mutilation. I don't dispute that. I think there's a, a strong evidence for that. I do. Aliens are not involved is also, I think, uh, a misrepresentation of, of what's going on. So it's kind of in an ideal setting. You'd like to see someone like Kelleher and yourself and Linda Milton Howe. And uh, yeah, Gabe Valdez and Chris as well, Chris O'Brien as well. Yeah. Everybody uh, talk to each other, not argue, right? But just discuss rationally this problem because I think all of us have points, and you know we have to respect our critics. We've got order come with Rick, okay. Gene, and Randall. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. Did you know that safe drinking water is the second most essential human need? Don't take your water for granted. Know what you're drinking. Get a ProPure 10 in-home water test kit for just $20, a $39 value, and test for 10 different water contaminants and conditions. Takes about 10 minutes and works with most potable city and well water sources. No salesman will call. Order your test kit today and receive a $20 coupon good towards the purchase of a ProPure water filter system. Visit a participating authorized ProPure dealer or ProPureUSA.com. Are you afraid to go to the mailbox because of letter after letter from the IRS? Are they stacking on more and more penalties and interest? By now, you know the problem won't go away on its own. Don't let the IRS chase you to your grave with penalties and interest and liens and levies. You need real help now. I'm Dan Pilla. I wrote the book on tax debt settlement, and I helped thousands of people solve tax problems they thought couldn't be solved. I can help you too. Call 800-34-NO-TAX or go to my website, danpilla.com. That's danpilla.com, danpilla.com. For USA Radio News, I'm Wendy King. An airline mechanic stole an empty Horizon Air plane in Seattle and took off. He was chased by military aircraft before crashing into a nearby island. Police say the 29-year-old was suicidal and appeared to have acted alone. Horizon Air Chief Operating Officer Constance Van Mulen. We believe it was taken by a single Horizon Air employee and that no other passengers or crew were on board. Shortly thereafter, it crashed near Keytron Island by South Tacoma. The pilot, who was doing stunts in the air, told air traffic controllers he was a broken guy with a few screws loose. I got a lot of people that care about me, and it's going to disappoint them to hear that I did this. I would like to apologize to each and every one of them. You're listening to USA Radio News. This is an urgent health notice for all residents suffering from back, neck, knee, and wrist pain. You may qualify for a pain-relieving brace at little or no cost to you, but the deadline is fast approaching. Simply call the Health Alert Hotline now. You heard right. You may qualify for a pain-relieving back, neck, knee, or wrist brace. These items may even be covered by Medicare or your private insurance. The Health Alert Hotline is your brace company. These specialized braces have been tested for pain relief. Call us toll-free right now to determine 
determine your eligibility and to learn how to use your private insurance or Medicare to minimize your out-of-pocket cost. Don't wait. If the deadline passes, you may lose your opportunity to get a pain-relieving back, neck, knee, or wrist brace at little or no cost to you. 800-296-1261. 800-296-1261. 800-296-1261. That's 800-296-1261. Have you checked your Google search results lately? Search results are usually the first impression that people form of you or your business. So make sure that they create a positive impression with ReputationDefender.com. What the Internet says about you can have a big impact on your life and your livelihood, even if it's not true. Fortunately, you can now control how you look online and in online search results with ReputationDefender.com. Call 800-831-0771 now. That's 800-831-0771 for your free reputation analysis. If you have negative material from an ex-employee, upset patient, or former client, newspaper article, legal issue, social media, or other source showing up in your search results, you can combat it with ReputationDefender.com. Our dedicated experts in patented technology can help make your online search results look their best. Call 800-831-0771 to learn more. 800-831-0771. That's 800-831-0771. Or visit ReputationDefender.com. This is Jerome Clark, author of the UFO Encyclopedia and other books. You're listening to the Paracast. I want to dovetail into near-death experiences because we mentioned UFO abductions. And if Richard Mm -hmm. hasn't seen what we've talked about there, he might find it interesting. Richard Bonenfant and J. Randall Murphy and Gene Steinberg, and we continue, and we're just framing different aspects of the problem. Let's try to wrap it up on mutilations this segment because I want to go to the NDE. I think that's a really great attitude, Richard, and I'm sure it's one that Chris would definitely go for if uh, the rest of the people in the research community on this could uh, all pull together. Uh, in fact, I, I don't know if it would even be possible to pull off some sort of a, you know, a grand meeting between all of these people, uh, just just to to get it all out on the table and do exactly what you're saying. Have a constructive argument or debate or comparison of the facts and get some attention on it so that real scientists can take it seriously as well. I agree with that 100%. And I think it can't be done all at once. It has to be. It has to start with uh, two people with opposing views talking it over rationally, and then it has to be joined by people who are more specialists who could contribute to the argument, giving their points of view as well, and then working on some sort of consensus where all of them agree. And I think that just like uh, negotiating a treaty or some political questions, you know, I think that. We have a tendency to adhere to our internal um, prejudices without realizing their prejudices. And we have to break away from that, and we have to find a way to respect the facts, the statistics, and, and, and the, the hard research that's coming out in the professional literature and, and abide by what the professional findings are and try to work our understanding into that rather what, than uh, going off on a tangent and with with uh, hypotheses that may lead nowhere. That's a really healthy attitude. Uh, in your look at all of this work, what would you say is some of the best professional and amateur work done on the subject that you can think of? Well, you know, I think a lot of the best work is really being done by amateurs because in the professional community, they kind of avoid controversy because of problems with status and and respect and and their uh, positions of authority. I think they don't really tackle the really serious problems uh, unless it, it's so specific that they kind of protected by the specificity of what they're doing. That's really interesting. We've we've got another question for in our forum for you here that has to do exactly with that. It's from. Uh, a forum poster named Without Limits 9. And he's asking, he's curious to know if your research has been frowned upon by more mainstream schools 
uh, like UF and Santa Fe, you know, have you run into any kind of professional criticism yourself for your involvement in this type of work? Well, uh, whoever asked the question, I'll have to uh, tell them that I've pretty much waited until I retired before I delved into these things. When I was <laughs> working as a professional, yeah, I was trying safe. to find out. I was trying to find out what caused uh, what the effects of minor birth defects were in the long run for children, and uh, I I was pretty much concerned with doing the best I could with those problems, and I didn't feel that I would. Uh, I felt I would jeopardize my standing if I started talking about UFOs and aliens and abductions and prions, which I didn't know anything about at the time anyway. But I think there's a reluctance by people who are professionals to get involved with this because it taints them. And I don't know if you remember John Mack. He was a, a Harvard professor of, of uh, psychiatry. Absolutely. He was uh, re reprimanded because he was studying alien abductions. I think that a lot of my colleagues are afraid of that, and they'll only talk to me in private about their, their views. They won't talk in any public forum. Do they talk yeah. to you in private? So, so yeah. how many people have you talked to in private uh, who are professionals that have an interest in this, roughly, would you say? A few dozen? or? Well, well let me see. I would say not even that many. I would say probably 12, maybe. Oh, that's a fair number. Yeah, and so th fine. these are people who have credentials and are seriously interested in it, but just don't want to get themselves involved in it on a professional level out of fear of their career. Yes, that's exactly right. Very interesting. Yeah, but there is an interest at the professional level that it's covert. And the people who are doing a lot of the real work are people who are amateurs, but who are dedicated by curiosity and a, a, like a, a driving force to seek the truth of what's happening, not not what they want to be the truth, but what actually is the truth. So they're truth seekers who are not professionals that are dedicating themselves to trying to find out what's going on. Now, I wonder at what level do our people in the civilian sector who have the labs, the scientific labs, who are doing the animal testing, for example, and are actually slicing off these slim slices of brain material and doing the high tech work in the sterilized environment that's required, that's getting up there in the system quite high. I wonder yeah. how far above them we have to go before we get into this, all this clandestine stuff with black helicopters and aliens. Have you found any sort of link to link the chain down or upwards in any of those directions? Where well, would it be? I think a lot of technicians and scientists are just dedicated to, to finding out the truth in their particular search for um, a cure of a disease or what's causing a disease. Or um, I think those are very dedicated people, but they're not concerned about the end results of their findings. I think you have to go a couple steps higher into the political and economic uh, levels of concern before you get a, a, um, a censorship of, of the findings or, or taking findings that are meant to, for one purpose and converting them for another purpose. For example, weaponizing something that's been discovered that could be useful for the military or even in, in bio warfare, you know, <laughs> maybe weaponizing prions. I don't know, but it seems like the scientists who are devoted so the science are doing their job, but it's the next level, the one who, who uh, kind of orchestrate the findings at the economic and political level that are the culprits in, in this process. Interesting. Well, we know biowarfare has been banned, so far as we know. So, you know, it's... So it has it, to go covert, covert. Yeah. It's still so, done. It's just covertly done. I mean, I imagine that somebody might say, well, look, what if somebody develops this? What do we do about it? And right. where are we going to take our sampling from? But wouldn't you think it would be easier for our own people in, say, in the Department of Defense, some covert lab that's dealing with this, to simply have their own ranch and to grow their own cattle? Why would they need to go out and, and you know, abduct other people's cattle and then drop them by their doorway? You'd think that they'd want to do it covertly. That's the last 
the last way they'd go about it. So what's going on with that? I can't give you a good answer to that question, but I do have an observation. I think that the covert part that's being taking place by either the military or 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 high high end health uh, organizations uh, is trying to discover what the aliens are doing and why they're doing it more so than actually running an independent type of research on on the study of prions. I think prions are being studied in universities and and there's a lot of work being done leading to Nobel Prizes. But um, I think that is like sporadic and, and piecemeal. But I think that the, the covert operations is something that's highly organized. For example, taking place all over the world. Rick, let's see an example in our next segment. We'll persist with this answer in our next segment. Then I really want to jump into near-death experiences. With Gene Randall and Rick, you're in the Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Do you need a website? Well, you can get a great deal on hosting services with Namecheap's legendary coupon code. They're offering substantial hosting discounts on shared hosting, business hosting, VPS hosting, reseller hosting, and even dedicated servers. Namecheap is preferred by millions. It's backed by a money-back guarantee. Use the coupon code LEGENDARY to cash in on the special deal at Namecheap.com, Namecheap.com. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. Get the ultimate knife at an ultimate price. The Fox Karambit Knife. Finally available in the U.S. The Fox Karambit Knife opens with one hand. Faster than you can pull a handgun. For utility, for defense, and for way less than other knives of this caliber. Go to TheUltimateKnife.com. Truly the best knife you will ever own. And only available at TheUltimateKnife.com. Use promo code RADIO at checkout for free shipping. Get the ultimate knife at the ultimate price at TheUltimateKnife.com. Hunters, anglers, campers, and survivalists. Get back to nature. Expand your horizons with the highest quality, most versatile, unique slingshots and sling bows on the market at slingbow.com. Slingbow products are compact and models start from just $17.98. They're perfect for your bug out bag or storing in your vehicle. Give yourself and your loved ones the excitement and tradition of Slingbow. A new frontier in archery and truly modern twist on this primitive survival tool. Feel the thrill only at slingbow.com. Homemakers, groceries by mail ships free. Try our amazing bacon. It stores in your pantry. No refrigeration required. Our value-added packaging provides a 10-year shelf life and protects the leanest, thickest, center-cut, fully-cooked bacon in America today. Ready to eat right from the pouch or warm and serve. Always price less than grocery for your everyday use. Savory and delicious. Order today at readytoeatbacon.com. Readytoeatbacon.com. Normal blood pressure, naturally. How would that make you feel? I'm Don from New Mexico. Uh, January of 2000, I had a heart attack. Uh, Then my real health began going downhill. I had high blood pressure, diabetes, poor vision. I wasn't sleeping well. I was a mess. Don reports dramatic improvements with heart and body extract. I started taking heart and body extract from within a few days. I started sleeping better. My blood pressure normalized. My diabetes normalized. My sleep improved. Experience these benefits and more when your body heals itself with the assistance of heart and body extract order at hbextract.com or call 866-295-5305 that's hbextract.com or call 866-295-5305 and folks 
I did not expect this at all. By the seventh, eighth, and ninth day, I saw dramatic improvements from taking Heart and Body Extract. Heart and Body Extract comes with a 100% ironclad money back guarantee. Details at hbextract.com or call 866-295-5305 for Heart and Body Extract. This is Jessica Armand, founder of My Magic Mud. Our team helped organize a successful effort to remove fluoride from our city's water supply. This is our passion. My Magic Mud Oral Care purifies and brightens your smile naturally. GCN listeners, please support my family business by purchasing our products from your local health food store. We're also available at CVS Pharmacy. Or visit us at MyMagicMud.com and take 10% off now with coupon code GCN10. This is Robert Hastings, author of UFOs and Nukes, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. So, Rick, let's finish this answer and maybe go to the question of whether there's any hope we'll solve any of this, and then we'll move on. Go ahead, please. I think I was saying that, well, actually, I don't remember what I was saying, but I... I, I we were talking about the various... Levels yeah, of agency. bureaucracy yeah. and so on, where where this work is being done, and and you're suggesting that what's going on on the covert end is that we've got say something from the DoD uh, going out and chasing after incidents where alien involvement has taken place in order to try and figure out what they're doing. So, what yeah, do you think right. then? I guess to close this out, what are the aliens doing when they take a cow and stick it in some? Uh, uh, lab of their own and, and are drawing fluid out of it. I mean, are they using it to try and figure it out to help us or to, uh, are they feeding it back to us to try to, is it, is it some sort of bio warfare or are they just, no. or could they just care less and they're just studying it the same as we are? No, no, it's, I think they have a vested interest in, in this problem. And I think it, it has to do with contamination. I think probably the earth is a pearl among planets and maybe where Earth-like planets are rare, and um, they are concerned that, that this type of infection or disease could ruin the biosphere of the planet, or it has something to do with their own interests, but they're not doing it to, to harm us, I don't think. I think they're just doing it because they have interest and in, in investment, perhaps. I feel it's more something like that. I don't think they're trying to, to do anything Interesting. I think they're just trying to protect their investment, so to speak. I don't know. <laughs> so we have an investment in uh, in cattle, and they have an investment in us. <laughs> so well, there we are again. Like we've that. we've yeah, moved uh, down. Uh, we've moved down once yeah. again in the food chain. Yeah. Uh, very interesting hypothesis. So uh, uh, maybe uh, we should uh, move on. And and uh, Gene, you were wanting to talk a bit about near death experiences. How about we carry on then? And um, in addition to the cattle mutilation mystery, uh, you've done some work and some looking into the whole uh, phenomena of near-death experiences. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, I think anybody who has a brain should be curious about these episodes because they're well-documented and they've been around for quite a while. And near-death experiences occur not only near death, but they can occur spontaneously without the stress of death. Um, being present. And of course, each near death experience is unique. They have common features, but they can be mostly unique. And what is going on is currently uh, under a paradigm that the brain is the, uh, is the vault of memory and uh, of, of feeling and thought and experience. That in, in other words, that that neurons or chains of neurons link, uh, link us to memories and recall and knowledge and understanding <laughs> everything that's a higher function, for example. The people who die and who experience clinical death where their heart isn't beating and there's no brain activity uh, and are resuscitated, they come back and they report experiences which their brain couldn't have 
been doing because it was not active. There was no neural neuronal uh, transmission of signals in different parts of the brain. Okay, so and, and uh, who, just to be clear, when you're saying that, so when there was there was no fear of death, we're not saying that that these people didn't die. We're, we were just saying that they weren't afraid of dying, but they did well, die, that's, and that's then that's they a came byproduct. back. That, right. That's a, I think that's a, a byproduct or uh, an after effect of the experience because a lot of people are fearful of death, but once they they uh, have a near death experience. And whether they're clinically dead or not, they they see an alternate an alternate reality. Uh, they seem to lose their fear because their consciousness convinces them that they're still the same person and everything, but they're in an alternate reality. And it's not like everything just goes flat, and your memory and your existence just goes flat. It it kind of reaffirms that there's a something higher than what we consider brain consciousness now or, or organic conscious fly in the ointment folks let me throw the fly in the ointment okay we ran an article from a blogger named miguel and he's known as red pill junkie he's a gentleman from mexico who's also a pretty terrific artist he does mm-hmm. books he did a great cartoon of me for the show And he wrote a long piece in our newsletter suggesting here that near-death experiences and UFO abductions are exceedingly similar in many ways. Have you heard that? I believe that. I study both. (laughs) I think there's a lot of parallel. For example, did you know that both near-death experiencers and people who have abducted have... um, like a negative electromagnetic influence on sensitive instrumentation around them. For example, your wristwatch won't work anymore, or it works very slow, or when you pass by a TV, it flicks on, or when you go by a lamp, it'll flick on or off depending upon its state. Let me just ask you about the watches. Okay, we obviously have different kinds of watches. We have mechanical watches. We have quartz watches. We have Apple Watches, which is, by the way, the best-selling watch in the world right now. Does it affect all of them or just the old-fashioned kind? Well, I don't know about Apple Watches because they're pretty recent. But uh, I had someone who I was, um, I gave a lecture, and he came to me uh, later on at a different time uh, where I worked. And he gave me a paper bag full of about 12 or 13 watches. And he says, some of these work and some don't. But ever since I bought them, they don't work on me. So I'm really referring to more of the uh, battery-operated watches uh, uh, as, as the examples that I, I intended to, to make. So, you know, the ones with the little batteries, not the wind-up ones, uh, but the electronic ones. And, so were you making uh, a I comparison a, here between uh, electronics being affected by uh, people yes, who have had an yes, NDE yes. and, uh, and uh, a UFO experience where, say, yes. people's cars no, no, or car radios did. have gone, have stopped, that type of thing? Oh, well, I wouldn't say that because uh, one woman who had an abduction experience where she she woke up and she found this creature sitting on her chest like the painting Nightmare, I think uh, it's a 17th century, 18th century painting. She, she compared it to that. And after that experience and a couple other experiences, so much of that, uh, she walked by her printer and her printer was not plugged into the electrical outlet and the printer started to run by itself. So that's pretty fantastic if you think about it. And I uh, had a, um, a uh, a director who was uh, also a doctor who was uh, actually my boss, and um, she couldn't use her, her computer because she couldn't control her mouse. And, um, and not only that, but uh, she kept having to replace her her, uh, her memory board and her um, operating system because it just wouldn't work anymore. So these are all effects that seem to come from the person to the object 
which, which is dysfunctional. And that occurs both in people who had near-death experiences and people who have um, uh, in, um, uh, uh, encounters with aliens. Okay, yeah. so we go back to the core question here. If they are so similar, and we assume or we gather that UFO abductions are supposed to be actual aliens physically capturing people, performing medical tests on them, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and near-death experiences occur where the body is very briefly dead and then is brought back to life after a few minutes. And we're saying these things, even though they supposedly on the surface have totally, totally different causes, physical testing by beings from other planets and briefly being dead, at the end of the day, they're almost the same. And if they're almost the same, then perhaps here, and we can get into the can of worms, perhaps here, it's not ET at work. And the clinical death puts you into an alternate state of consciousness let's get into more of this with rick gene and randall you're in the paracast thank you for listening to gcn visit gcnlive.com today We also have swag. You know, we have all these exclusive Paracast things that you can buy. We've got like, I guess, 60 or so different items. And entails t-shirts, sleeves for notebook computers, iPad cases, mouse pads, the Paracast jumbo tote bag, all sorts of t-shirts and jackets and stuff like that for men and women. We have a Paracast aluminum water bottle. All this stuff, you go to store.theparacast.com, store.theparacast.com. What makes it special is that the items are the best quality, you know, great T-shirts, fabrics, and they have our official logo on them. That's what makes them special in multiple sizes and colors. We even have stuff for children, stuff for women, stuff for men. We have all sorts of sizes, like small up to X large. A lot of good stuff. That's the swag from the Paracast. If you go to store.theparacast.com, stop by and take a shopping tour. Eating, working, living pain-free. These are things many of us take for granted. But for many adults with disabilities who are elderly or have serious medical issues, dental care is simply unaffordable. Dental Lifeline Network is looking for dentists who can change this. DLN is asking dentists and their teams to volunteer to just see one of the many patients in need. You can literally change a life. When you volunteer with DLN's donated dental services program to see one, you treat a pre-qualified patient in your office at your convenience. We handle the details so you can focus on the care. Lack of dental care can lead to the inability to have life-saving surgery, eat, or contribute to our community. If you are a dentist or know a dentist, please share this message. Will You See One? Visit willyouseeone.org to help change one life in your community today. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. So, Richard, what do we make of this? Well, I think we're chasing the wrong horse. I think that the common denominator is trauma. I think it's the trauma of death or the trauma of the realization that you're dealing with something beyond your understanding that it triggers this. So whether it be alien abduction or a near or a near death event, like falling from a high place or something, both involve psychological or some sort of trauma. And I think trauma is what makes these quirks here in our lives. I don't know, these unexplainable things. In both cases of near-death experiences and alien abductions, people sometimes develop psychic abilities. 
which they didn't have or they didn't realize they had before. And there are several other parallels as well that link uh, these these events together. But I, I believe myself that it is not the experience because near-death experience occur to people who are not near-death as well. But I don't think it's that. It's some sort of trauma in the realization that things aren't what they seem to be. When you're talking yeah. about near, near-death experiences that happen to people who aren't near death, aren't we referring there more to an out, out-of-body experience? That's what I would call a, a psychic after effect. Some people can do, you know, at will have uh, out-of-body experiences. Some people can do remote viewing. But what I'm saying is after a people, somebody experiences a traumatic event, that ability may be uh, manifest, more manifest or increased somehow so that they are more cognizant of it and more able to use it, have more control. Over it. Okay, I think I see what you're saying there. Uh, I recall a story, actually, I think this was one of our forum people uh, related to us who was in a car accident and went into a state where he was uh, looking down on the whole scene it wasn't my impression that he was uh, near death at the time, but the whole thing was very uh, traumatic, as you say. There's other things, too, I should point out. You know, people who have near-death experience, they come back with veridical experiences. That is, experiences where they couldn't have known something, but during their near-death experience, they learned something which later turned out to be true. And that is very convincing to the person who has that event happen to them that the near-death experience was, was something extraordinary. For example, uh, sometimes people come back with, uh, like with visions of things that are about to happen, and they happen, and they're recorded the, after the near-death experiences, and, and at some point a month or two later, they happen just as they were seen by the people who had the near-death experience. Some sort of a premonitory. Yeah. yeah. They, they yeah. develop a premonition. Right. Interesting. And some, some people who had these experiences, either one of them, uh, develop the ability to see auras around people, and they can tell their mood just by the color of their auras. And that's something that they never experienced before or saw before, and they, they can't explain it, but they seem to have it. What I was doing in my dissertation, my PhD dissertation, was trying to determine if these were temporary changes or long-lasting changes. So I studied the after effects to see if they would go away or disappear or whether they were permanent. They're more on the permanent side, but not completely permanent. There's some reduction in them, but they they seem to last for years and decades, a long, long long time. So you're saying that someone who's developed the ability to be able to see auras, uh, that they retain that ability? And so every time they look at someone, they can actually see the person's aura? Yeah. What they also say, though, is sometimes they can control it and sometimes they can't. So it may be the case where they frequently see auras around people, but not always or not when they want to, but more frequently they do. And they can tie the color or the shade of the aura to uh, the person's mental health or a state of emotional excitement or something like that. Right. Things to do with uh, their mental state. Now, our listeners and our foreign people, they know I'm pretty skeptical when it comes to all of this stuff. But I want to say right now that uh, once upon a time, I saw my best friend at the Times, Ara. We were just sitting in a room together, and I just happened to glance over at him just the right way. The room was kind of dim, and it was like there he was. He was glowing with this incredible light that is can only be described as an aura. It was the one and only time I've ever had that experience. I've never been able to duplicate it or repeat it again. And he thought I was nuts at the time. He looked at me like he thought I was crazy and uh, you know, just making something up. But some years later, the same thing happened to him with his girlfriend when they were out uh, on a hike, I believe he said. Mm-hmm. So he actually got in touch with me and he said, you know, I thought you were nuts at the time, but when it happened to me, I know you're not. That anecdotal verification that these things exist, like out-of-body experiences and seeing horrors and being able to heal, 
you don't have controlled studies where you can replicate it and do it at will, but you, you, people experience it sporadically throughout their lives, I think. And it may be ours or it may be something else, but we do experience it. If you ask anybody in a nursing home, you know, about the strangest things that happen to them, you'll, you'll get a long litany of things that are unexplainable. I imagine. Now, have you heard of a researcher called Persinger? Yes, I guess he stimulates the temporal lobe with electromagnetic pulses to emulate uh, near-death experiences and altered states of consciousness. Is that right? Right. Actually, you're completely correct. That's Michael Persinger. He's Canadian, and he's got the thing called the God Helmet. It's nickname, and he's been able to replicate these experiences with this using exactly the process that uh, you've described. So I find it really interesting in that if it can be done empirically like this, you were saying, well, you know, we can't seem to do it on command, but he can with this particular device. And, and that seems to lend credence to the theory that it is an electromagnetic phenomena in the brain that is responsible for the emergence of this sort of perceptual experience. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to take issue with you, not because I find any fun in it, but I had a patient who I presented to the uh, Albany uh, Brain Trauma Conference, the annual brain conference, who had a, a brain cancer. Persinger seems to focus on the right temporal lobe, and this individual had multiple near-death experiences with the absence of the right temporal lobe. They had removed it. So I don't think I can actually support that argument. The other thing that, I, that I'm aware of is some people who've had actual near-death experiences have put on the helmet, and they say the experience is similar but not the same as their near-death experience. Sure. Of course, now we're finding that the brain tends to share a lot of its processing throughout the brain in a much more yes, yes. non-regionalized manner. We yeah. could still be talking about the same sort of phenomena, but not as, say, isolated to any particular lobe or another. I agree with that. You've probably heard of the AWARE study then as well. Perhaps you should refresh me. I, I'm, oh, okay. a little, I'm getting a little old now. <laughs> sure, uh, no problem. This is a fairly large-scale study by the people, uh, the International Association for Near-Death Studies, And uh, you can find it on their site. And what they did is they managed to get into a bunch of hospitals, images that were put up and above the patients in operating theaters. Right, yeah. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about there, right? They had like numbers, numbers up above an instrument that couldn't be seen from the level of the patient. And if it was truly out of body, he would be able to go up to the ceiling and see what number or what image was there on top of some instrument, something like that. Right. They had over 2,000 patients from 15 hospitals, and none of them came out and went through that and were able to identify any of these uh, images that were there. There was one patient that described a scene, but unfortunately that room wasn't one of the ones where one of these controlled experiments was taking place. Let's break. We got Rick. Gene and Randall, you're in the Paracas. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a thrill a minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors. Classic science fiction at its best. Available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R O C K O I D S.com. Hi, I'm Dr. Bill Deagle, MD, A A E M, A C A M, A4M, of Nutramedical.com. 
and a consultant providing email advice free on advanced protocols for your optimized wellness and advanced technologies to heal and regenerate you. You can contact us at NutraMedical.com, that's N-U-T-R-I Medical.com, or 888-212-8871. You get free email starter protocols of our top medical-grade nutraceuticals, initial testing, and recommendations for your own primary doctor to do, as well as recommendations to give you an idea of a consultation and a full protocol to try to help you regenerate your tissues, heal naturally without the use of toxic polypharmacy. I can send test kits to you as well anywhere in the world and provide you recommendations for referral of specialty clinics worldwide. So contact me, Dr. Bill Deagle, at NutraMedical.com. That's N-U-T-R-I Medical.com or 888-212-8871. Looking for that edge during those intimate moments? We see many ads for enhancement, but the side effects include death. At GCN Team, we should change the Healthy Body Brain and Heart Pack to the Healthy Libido Pack. The brain and heart are not the only organs that require a healthy vascular system. For proper blood flow at the right moment, go to GCNteam.com or call 877-878-4203. That's 877-878-4203. That's 877-878-4203. Have you checked your Google search results lately? Search results are usually the first impression that people form of you or your business. So make sure that they create a positive impression with ReputationDefender.com. What the Internet says about you can have a big impact on your life and your livelihood, even if it's not true. Fortunately, you can now control how you look online and in online search results with ReputationDefender.com. Call 800-831-0771 now. That's 800-831-0771 for your free reputation analysis. If you have negative material from an ex-employee, upset patient, or former client, newspaper article, legal issue, social media, or other source showing up in your search results, you can combat it with ReputationDefender.com. Our dedicated experts in patented technology can help make your online search results look their best. Call 800-831-0771 to learn more. 800-831-0771. That's 800-831-0771. Or visit ReputationDefender.com. Hunters, anglers, campers, and survivalists. Get back to nature. Expand your horizons with the highest quality, most versatile, unique slingshots and sling bows on the market at slingbow.com. Slingbow products are compact and models start from just $17.98. They're perfect for your bug out bag or storing in your vehicle. Give yourself and your loved ones the excitement and tradition of Slingbow, a new frontier in archery and truly modern twist on this primitive survival tool. Feel the thrill only at slingbow.com. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Randall, please continue. So so what we've got is a situation where we've got a, a controlled study done to try to determine whether or not people are seeing objective realities or some subjective reality that has been manufactured uh, by some process that we don't know about and uh, entered into the person's memory. Yes, I understand. And it it didn't really work out statistically. It didn't produce any results that were uh, positive, I think, right? Right, and there's that's not the only study. There's been more where they've done similar things with specific phrases and words, and none of them have produced any definitive results whatsoever. There are always these sort of anecdotal ones where there's no controlled environment for people to be able to say with some sense of certainty that there can be no mistaking what the person saw. I think we're talking about dampening. I think that uh, you know, Ryan conducted a lot of statistical tests on, you know, these cards that have different shapes on them. And he took well-known psychics and he, he put them to the test. And even though uh, the psychics had ability, they just didn't perform well on those tests. And they all told him that it, it was just too boring. <laughs> I don't know if that's an excuse or not, but uh, I think that it's very hard to control this ability, whatever it is, this paranormal ability, through uh, what we, you know, what we can devise. I think it's it's 
more like mercury. It just seems to split off and go off in its own direction whenever you try to capture it. Sort of but like the uncertainty principle. That, if you, if yeah, you try to it, measure it, it, you, it just won't happen. You can't get the measurement right. when you try to measure it. Right. But I mean, really, that that's not a very, very strong counterpoint when you consider that in all cases, virtually 100% of all of these cases where people have claimed to have some sort of a near-death experience involving an out-of-body experience, that that is something that they've recalled later after they've been resuscitated and they're conscious and their brain is working. In other words, we we can't, and it's impossible to have an experience relayed by somebody who's never come back or is dead or doesn't have a brain. In every instance, it's been somebody with a brain. And the, the irresistible conclusion there is that it does have something to do with the brain, but we just don't know what. Well, I think there's a new um, paradigm being developed by um, Ken van Lommel. He's a Dutch near-death experience uh, cardiologist. Right. Yeah, I've looked into his stuff. Same thing. Like every single example he's come up with that I and I've dug and dug and dug. Same thing. What we're dealing with at best is something that is perceived to be a memory. And that memory is stored somewhere in that person's brain, uh, at least the best that neuroscience can tell us. I suppose there's a theory that memory is non-local, but we don't really have any locality. We don't really have any evidence of that, though. Well, I think that Tim Van Rommel and Bruce Grayson and Peter Fenwick are all working on the idea of a new paradigm that the mind, the mind is some sort of transducer that allows us to experience things and send it off into a, a different level of consciousness and be able to um, retrieve things from, from some level of consciousness that we have no memory of. Uh, perhaps like reincarnation experiences, but that the the, the locus or the, the locality of these experiences and memories is the, is not the instrument, not the radio, but the radio wave, and that these things are non-physical, so it's non-local, and it doesn't exist in the brain. A new hypothesis is coming out to explain it. But I agree with you that it's disheartening to have those experiments and have negative results. But I, I would um, caution you not to drop the ball because that didn't work, that we just may not be approaching it the right way. Oh, certainly there's a mystery there because we're yeah. not sure how the brain can come up with a memory of something when at the at the time it didn't it wasn't functioning in the way that any neuroscientist would accept a accept a brain to be normally functioning so the the sort of the theories are that well when the brain comes back to life of of course there's going to be changes that take place during the time that the brain isn't functioning and that those changes when the brain is awaken again and goes back into functioning, start to sort themselves out and make the best of it that they can, and being such fabulous pattern recognition machines that we are, start to make sense of it in whatever way that it can. And therefore, these images are created not something like a dream state, but they're put into our memory bank, and then they're recalled as something that was believed to have happened while they were actually uh, brain dead, but that wasn't really the case. Well, I would recommend that you read uh, a neuroscientist's uh, point of view of, of having experienced a near-death experience. His name is Eben Alexander. He's a, uh, uh, he's a neuroscientist, and I think he's right now in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia, and he's doing work with uh, Bruce Gleason and the near-death people on uh, the matter of consciousness. He was a person who was a neuroscientist who performed these uh, surgeries on the brain. He had a complete bias in that favor. Then he experienced a near-death. He had a near-death experience where his brain became mush, and then it took months and months to reorganize. But after his reorganization, he believes that there is an alternate state of consciousness that we're not aware of. Right. He's the proof of heaven guy. Right. And so, yeah, right. you know, I've, I've, 
I find this subject really interesting. And I would like to believe that there's something out there that's like that. It's just that every time I look into these people's claims, there's always these the same factor that we can't escape the fact that anyone who's come back to tell us anything about that has a brain and that whatever they're telling us seems to be coming out of their brain. And you know, we don't have someone who is non-corporeal that can be measured and heard by a group of panelists who can interview them to say, well, oh, now you're a dead person. What's it like? Yeah, that just well, doesn't happen. There's, there, there's really no credible evidence for that whatsoever. But there are, there are people who have been brain dead, not for minutes, but for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, half an hour. And whose brain, uh, who, when they're resuscitated, uh, they, they're able to um, reorganize their brain and recall experiences that happened to them while they were incapacitated. Richard, we got to move along here because we've got to do a break. That little thing that happens on radio shows. There is a way to avoid the breaks and skip the breaks. If you get the Paracast Plus for more information, go to plus dot theparacast.com. Don't you dare miss, especially those at YouTube who say too many commercials. I don't want to scream. They'll destroy my voice at my age. Richard Jean, Randall, you're in the Paracast. <laughs> listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Water is the single most important thing your body needs, so you want to be sure it's the best for you and your family. Since 2005, thousands have depended on Berkey Purified Water. The Berkey Guy provides the lowest priced filtration systems in every size. For incredibly delicious water now and in an emergency, Get to GoBerkey.com or call 877-886-3653, 877-886-3653, GoBerkey.com. Get the ultimate knife at an ultimate price. The Fox Karambit Knife. Finally available in the U.S. The Fox Karambit Knife opens with one hand. Faster than you can pull a handgun. For utility, for defense, and for way less than other knives of this caliber. Go to TheUltimateKnife.com. Truly the best knife you will ever own. And only available at TheUltimateKnife.com. Use promo code RADIO at checkout for free shipping. Get the ultimate knife at the ultimate price. At TheUltimateKnife.com. USA Radio News with Chris Barnes. A change of plans from Republican Congressman Chris Collins of New York. He's now suspended his re-election campaign after being indicted on insider trading charges. USA's Wendy King reports. The three-term congressman announced the decision on Twitter. Earlier this week, after he appeared in court to answer securities and wire fraud charges, he said that he would clear his name and remain on the ballot. And I will remain on the ballot running for re-election this November. Prosecutors say Collins illegally shared information about the failure of a drug being tested by a company that he had invested in. On this anniversary of the deadly Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, a Unite the Right 2 demonstration is set for the nation's capital, expected to bring hundreds of participants and thousands of counter-protesters. This is USA Radio News. Are you tired of high cable TV rates? Sign up for Dish today and get a $500 bonus offer while supplies last. Plus, lock in your price for two years guaranteed. Call All-American Dish, your Dish-authorized retailer now. 800-610-5739. 800-610-5739. That's 800-610-5739. Offers require credit qualification, 24-month commitment, early termination fee, and e-auto pay. Restrictions apply. Call for details. With a recession ending, if you've been putting off building your business, now is the time to act. General Steel will meet or beat any price on a pre-engineered steel building of the same size and specifications. Act now before steel prices go up. So call us today for free information. Call 800-965-1290. 800-965-1290. 800-965-1290. It's been said. 
any society is only three missed meals away from chaos. Those times may be near. Think about it. Our country faces multiple terrorist threats and aggressions from Russia and North Korea. Social unrest and violent marches yet again may lead to looting of stores and city shutdowns. And our crumbling infrastructure leaves our power grid vulnerable to long-term outages from a single cyber attack. When the chaos from any one of these threats arises, the government knows it can't provide during a widespread national emergency. That's why you need your own plan for self-reliance. That's where My Patriot Supply comes in. Get a four-week survival food supply for only $99. That includes breakfast, lunches, and dinners. Order online at preparewithgcn.com. $99 bucks for four weeks of survival food that tastes like homemade cooking and lasts up to 25 years from My Patriot Supply. Get your kits today at preparewithgcn.com. Free shipping is included. Preparewithgcn.com. Hey, this is Marie D. Jones, the author of This Book is from the Future, and you are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Richard, part two of that answer? Excuse me, I missed uh, the transition there a little bit. Is it my turn to speak? Yes, sir. You're providing some uh, counterpoint to on the whole evidence issue where people who have come back from operating theaters do relay experiences that seem at the time to not be explainable and that that is considered as uh, some sort of reasonable evidence that this event had taken place as described. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm thinking of a woman named Pam something. I can't recall her last name who was undergoing brain surgery and, uh, apparently died during that surgery, and she was, uh, after she was resuscitated, she uh, gave a a running account of what the doctors were doing at the time that they were operating on her and thought that she was dead. Right. Uh, There's possible mundane explanations for that. And, you know, one of the things we do on the forums is we have a lot of point and counterpoint and we really sure. try to get to the truth of, of the matter on these situations. And one of the points I make when these things are brought up is that when people go in to have those kinds of operations, they're usually prepared for them ahead of time. Uh, it doesn't usually happen right on the spot. Uh, and even if it does, there's a lot of social and cultural knowledge about this phenomena out there. But in a normal case, if you're preparing for a brain surgery or some major surgery, you're going to be into the hospital, you're going to be seeing doctors, you're going to be familiar with the environment, you're going to have your senses picking up a lot of things that are subconscious, including images of people and sounds of people around you during the time that you're there, pre-op and post-op, before you're even conscious again. And so it's entirely possible that given all of this conditioning, that what happens is that a person has this environment already in their mind and that when they go in and they die on the operating table something happens within their mind that is equivalent to a dream state organization of the neural pathways that when their brain wakes up again puts all of that together and says i'm in a hospital all of this has happened i know that must have happened and then it comes back to them in this visual type of a cue that seems to be a lot more reasonable from a cause and effect perspective than sort of, well, this mystical thing that rises up out of the body that nobody can explain. Uh, Well, my counterpoint to that is that that's a plausible explanation. But like people who see UFOs and people who don't see UFOs, if you've experienced being a UFO, you have an opinion. And somebody can say that it was the planet Venus or it was a light reflecting off the clouds or something like that, and you having experience that will not buy it, but you had the experience. The person who's trying to explain it didn't have the experience and comes up with a plausible explanation, and that could be is true as well. But it's almost like if you had the experience, you have one position. If you didn't have the experience, you have a plausible explanation for it. Well, that's pretty fair. I I do place a lot of uh, value in firsthand experience. And as a ufologist, 
and someone who has seen a UFO is I, I can completely relate to where you're coming from. But then again, we're dealing with two kettles, different kettles of fish here. In, in one situation, we're dealing with people who are normally normal functioning brains. They're, they just happen to look up and, and their perfectly functioning normal sensory apparatus picks up a stimuli that they s- interpret as some sort of mysterious flying object. Most of those actually do turn out to be something mundane. And when a person has it explained to them, they go, oh, okay, well, that was the case. So there's no reason that that can't be the same sort of thing. A person can be convinced, in other words, that they're seeing something strange from their own personal experience until it's explained to them in a way that makes sense. In an NDE, however, it's completely subjective. I mean, we're not dealing with, first of all, external stimuli. It's all taking place within the person's mind. Well. Let me try to get a, uh, an example between the two extremes. If somebody's had an uh, abduction experience and it's, it's traumatized them and they were taken aboard a, a craft and examined and uh, probed and <laughs> assaulted, shall we say, uh, psychologically and physically, and um, uh, they, they, they first of all have very little recall of it and then under, for example, hypnosis, they might have a little bit more recall, or they may spontaneously recall it. Uh, oftentimes, don't want to believe that that happened to them, and will deny it and try to avoid believing that something like that happened to them because they don't really want to admit that it could have happened. And you know that that's the case where we are consciously trying to find an excuse for not believing something that happened that may have happened. And, you know, there might be people who say, well, we didn't see him for half an hour or he wasn't around. And, you know, the, who, who would like verify that he wasn't present when he said he was being abducted. And he might have these memories of all kinds of traumatizing things that happened to him while he was abducted, but he has no way of proving it and no way of, of convincing anybody else. So basically what they retire to is, well, you know, if, if you feel like it didn't happen to me, it's okay. You, you, it's all right to believe that, but I know what happened to me. You know, they, they in their own mind, believe that the experience was real. Oh, I believe the experiences are real. I've, I've known people that have had the experience. Uh, my question is just in, in the interpretation of the experience. So a person can be entirely sincere. But again, what we're dealing with are sort of two different kettles of fish in that on one hand, we have an external stimulus, which is affecting a person's perceptual apparatus that is then being experienced and shunted into memory. In the other situation, what we have is a person who awakes after the experience is already over, after the fact. So we're dealing only with a memory. We're not dealing with any real-time input of stimulus into the person's mind in order to generate the memory. And so the mystery seems to be, well, how does that memory get there then? I can't answer that, but I can point out that sometimes when people are anesthetized and unconscious or or actually die, uh, that they can repeat conversations that took place while they were in a a death-like state. Uh, conversations that occurred in in the operating theater. How is that possible? And, well, I don't know. I, <laughs> I <laughs> I'm just I'm just pointing out a, a different example where they would not have picked this up subconsciously through being exposed to um, maybe uh, film clips of what was going to happen or talking to doctors and being told what was going to happen or picking that up from a nurse or something. Uh, but being, maybe, maybe uh, what's a, happening. Okay. How's this for a theory? I mean, I'm not a doctor. You are. So maybe, <laughs> maybe you could sort of well, say, PhD, well, you know, academic. <laughs> but you could maybe comment on how reasonable it might seem. So I know that our hearing centers are pretty much one of the last to go when we're dealing with people who are uh, in a brain death or near brain death when they're doing the, the uh, electro 
with his I, I understand what you're saying. Yes. Right. Okay, so I so you've got the you've got the net over their brain and they've got a little thing that goes in there and it vibrates and it sends signals through the eardrum into the brain. Mm -hmm. And and mm -hmm. when the brain is right down, even with that net on, and most people don't get that net put on them when they go into brain death in an OR, they just simply don't do it. They, they have mm -hmm. other right. types of things. You're right. Yeah. So, so what's happening is, and I've seen this because I experienced this because my brother was killed in a car accident and I had to be there to witness all of this. And I wanted to make sure beyond any reasonable doubt that his brain was gone before I would say, no, you, you pull the plug. Randall will pick up on this in our next segment. With Richard, Randall and Jean, you're in The Paracast. for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. As you know, neighbors, web hosting can be pretty cheap, but not all hosting is the same. DreamHost wins best of awards year after year. You get unlimited disk space, unlimited bandwidth, and even the low-cost plans put your sites on high-performance SSDs. Want to know more about what DreamHost has to offer? Go to technightowl.com slash host. Once again, that's technightowl.com slash host. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. If you like alkaline water or know someone that does, you're going to love the Dylan Living Water Bottle. It creates alkaline water on the go while reducing plastic waste and saving you money. Made with surgical grade stainless steel, the Dylan Bottle increases the pH up to 9 to deliver both alkaline and antioxidant water anywhere you want it. Alkaline water is healthier, tastes better, and can even boost energy. The Dylan Bottle makes it easy and affordable to be healthy and achieve optimal hydration. Get your Dylan Bottle today at dyln.co. That's dyln.co. Bacon lovers, we ship free. Try our amazing bacon. No refrigeration required. Proprietary value-added packaging provides 10-year shelf life and protects the leanest, thickest, center-cut, fully-cooked bacon in America today. Ready to eat right from the pouch or warm and serve. Savory and delicious. Wholesale price for your everyday use. Order today at readytoeatbacon.com. Readytoeatbacon.com. Healthcare reform is confusing. With the loss of the Obamacare mandate, those needing help can now choose an affordable alternative. By joining Liberty HealthShare, you're part of a community of health-conscious Americans all over the country who control their own healthcare costs and choices. Liberty HealthShare is not insurance. It is an association of self-pay patients who unite with like-minded people to share the cost of their medical needs. Neighbor helping neighbor. Learn more now by going to libertyoncall.org. That's libertyoncall.org. Long distance travel or long hours in front of a computer can take its toll on your body. Get relief for your neck or back pain when you search Amazon for sunshine pillows, heating wraps, and pads, often listed as an Amazon choice. Why take another pill? Now, from Sunny Bay and by customer demand, we introduce our extra long neck heating wrap, a complete wrap, wide and hands-free, and brings fast relief to those who suffer from neck or back pain. You can easily find sunshine pillows on Amazon. Or search Amazon for our new Sunny Bay disposable heat pads. Or look for Sunny Bay heated neck wraps for relief from back pain to menstrual pain and cramps. Sometimes life can be a pain in the neck or back or shoulder. See why our company, Biomed DB Design, has a lifetime 100% positive rating on both Amazon and Etsy. Just go to Amazon.com and search Sunny Bay or call us 253-678-1361. Has your body ever gone low blood sugar feeling weak, shaky, knowing you better eat something fast? 
We all know high blood sugar can lead to many metabolic problems. At GCNteam.com, we have a healthy blood sugar pack. Focusing on the structure and function of stable blood sugar. Find us at GCNteam.com or call 877-878-4203. Nothing feels worse than unstable blood sugar. Call 877-878-4203. That's 877-878-4203. Hi, this is Joshua P. Warren, author of The Poor Man's Paranormal, and you're listening to The Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Waiting with bated breath to find out what right. Randall has to say. Go ahead. So I watched how this was done, and I watched the actual chart being printed as it was happening at a certain threshold below all of the lines that you see on there they say well this is brain death and and yet you can see very low signal inputs still still happening but they say beyond this is just hopeless hypothetically what could still be happening is that the eardrums they don't stop functioning they they work on a pneumatic principle so they could hypothetically still be sending very very weak signals into the neurosystem that when the brain comes back is able to somehow pick up on those and being the amazing pattern recognition creatures that we are figure out what it meant i'm just this is a reach but i'm saying at least it's something that connects the dots in a, in a physical measurable way as opposed to right. just saying well it's all magic we don't know how it happens right does that well, sound reasonable? I, I respect that example, and I'm sorry that you had to experience that. It's a possible explanation. For scientists who are really, really um, critical, it's, it's hard to, to come up with some foolproof uh, uh, way of explaining it. It's just where you place your faith, your belief, you know, I think. I suspect that there is something having to do with a higher consciousness involved here. And uh, your uh, explanation of uh, the, you know, the, the functioning of the eardrum is, is also plausible. And I think that it's maybe because of our different experiences or our different approaches that we may see it differently. But I can respect what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. And that, I agree that that could be the case, too. Well, that's a really, there. Well, that's a really <laughs> healthy approach. I mean... I'm really glad that uh, we can have this kind of a conversation with someone who has your experience and wealth of knowledge and a scientific mind as well, who can consider you know, a rational, grounded, objective approach to the thing and, and not be, say, put off by what might seem like sort of a very skeptical point of view on afterlives and so on. People like me need people like you to keep our balance. And I think that we, we help each other if we listen to each other. That's a really healthy attitude. So now for me to completely flip this around the other way, <laughs> it, <Yeah. laughs> if we're talking about some sort of way that our consciousness or our memories can be stored in some sort of, uh, say, virtual cloud up, up there somewhere, then that seems to lend credence to this whole idea that maybe we're living in some kind of a, a vast simulation where all of our life experiences are essentially uh, shunted to a, a vast memory buffer and can be reconstructed at any time. And this is actually being taken seriously by some scientists and researchers and philosophers now. What do you think of that idea? You know, I understand that I'm a little bit behind the times, but the, the concept of a super reality, you know, having to do with uh, some physics, some form of physics that I, I don't understand is, is, is possible. But I have to tell you an honest experience. I, when I was a boy, I was around 12 years old, I dived into a lake and I didn't know how to swim. And uh, as I sank to the bottom, I thought that all I had to do was jump up and you know, move my arms and I would float to the surface. But I was raised in Maine, so it was always too cold to learn how to swim, and I didn't really know. So I just tried and tried until I ran out of breath. 
and I could see people above me floating on the surface, and they were like surfboards, and I could see them, but I couldn't touch them. I wasn't tall enough, or I was deeper than I thought. And the next thing I know is that I'm experiencing things that happened to me when I was two and three and four years old. Now, one of those memories came to me by some physiological process that these are memories that were stored in my mind, and I, I just somehow triggered them by having this near-death experience by anoxia, lack of oxygen, or something like that. I don't know, but what was not explainable is that I did things that were some of the things that were immoral, and I said I felt a, such a deep regret for that that it was like a revelation of something that I had never experienced before, like the sense of guilt that, that came with recalling these experiences that happened before I could even remember them when I was conscious. So I think that if some things are maybe a little more complex than we believe, and it convinced me that there was something to the near-death experience. However, I didn't do anything about this until I was about in my late 40s when I went back and got a degree on, uh, and did a thesis on near-death experiences, because I think I'm still searching for the truth of what happened to me. And maybe that's why people go into psychology, because they have problems that they're trying to figure out. I don't know. Thanks for sharing that. That's a really interesting story. It was almost as if I was there with you. I was visualizing looking up from under the water at these people above and, and imagining what it would be like to not be able to reach up and breathe. That must have been uh, really, really an amazing experience. How were you saved from that? I don't really know how I was saved. I kind of was in this alternate reality, and I think somebody must have spotted me, and they pulled me out. So I remember being pulled out of the water, and uh, I remember being put on a, it was a large rock on my stomach and then pressing on my back. It was like I was on the surface again, and I was coughing up water. Uh, but the memories of what happened were also fresh in my mind, and I was a little confused at the time. So I had to go back to the car with wrapped in a towel, and, and I just forgot to mention it to my parents because I just wanted to go swimming again someday. So <laughs> <laughs> I just kept it to myself. That's very, very interesting. I've heard quite a few similar stories from people. Uh, I love talking about this stuff, whether we can explain it or not. I absolutely believe that people have these experiences, that the phenomena itself exists, and that we certainly haven't explained it all. So thanks right. for coming on the show and sharing and uh, being willing to, to listen to someone like myself who, who does take a very skeptical no, objective. I really enjoy speaking to you, and uh, I think that's good for all of us. It's like breathing some fresh air. You know, sometimes we're in a closet too long, and it's good to get out in the sun and get some fresh air, and that's what it was for me. Speaking of fresh air, Richard, can you tell our listeners where they can find more of your stuff? Yes, but the only thing anybody has to do is go on the Internet, put my name, Richard Bonifant, put NDE, that'll get to my, uh, my, my articles, or put animal mutilations, that'll get to my articles or do um, UFO, that will get to some of my articles. Just put my name in the topic, and they should come up. You can find us on Twitter if you look for the PowerCast. Look for the PowerCast on Twitter. You can also find us with two official PowerCast fan clubs on Facebook. I don't know if Facebook's worth it. I guess it is. But you hear of all the security stuff, and you kind of sort of wonder. We also have an official PowerCast YouTube channel, going to be updated soon. And a brand new site, thepowercast.com, brand new version with a new Paracast store for all sorts of goodies coming up probably, and I think you know, next week or so, we are working with a developer and with, of course, Randall to get the thing put up. You can also check out the Paracast Plus. It's the way to order the show and not have the network ads. And in exchange for network ads, we charge you a little bit. $1.49 a week, $4.99 a month. We also have packages for five years and a lifetime. And in those cases, we give you free stuff. You've heard about free stuff? We give away free stuff. How about them apples? Free stuff. To find out more, go to plus.com.
theparacast.com. We also offer the After the Paracast podcast, which is not available except to subscribers, and we never know what's going to happen next. In fact, with our episode with Walter Bosley, it ended up being part two of that episode. To hear the rest of the story, you had to be a subscriber to the Paracast Plus. Go to plus.theparacast.com. Randall, tell us about your site. UFOpages.com. Okay, Richard, thank you so much for joining us on the Paracast. Hi, it was my pleasure, and I really enjoyed this. Thank you for inviting me. The Paracast, featuring Gene Steinberg and Christopher O'Brien, is a copyrighted presentation of Making the Impossible Incorporated. Tune in next week for a new adventure in The Paracast. <laughs>